Good morning, guys. It's March 26th, and today's title is going to be The Vision of or by Personal Purity. So, Vision by Personal Purity. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and the verse today is verse 8. When I get to verse 8, I will read it to you. And I'll go from there. Uh, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the introduction to it. So, we're going to be reading, I don't know if I'm going to be reading all of the Sermon on the Mount, but I'm going to be reading the Beatitudes. So, let's see here. This is just the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, so I'm not going to do go into more. Just the very beginning. So chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount Introduction. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now this is the verse of the day, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So he's talking about bless are all these things. But we're going to be talking more about blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So let's see what that says. Those who have received a new moral nature in regeneration will see him manifest himself in one's life. So when you get to this point, you want to change your, your life around. You'll, we will see it. See it. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to read out my study Bible here. Okay, so Matthew 5-7 through 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus gave it on a hillside near Capernaum. This sermon probably covered several days of preaching. In it, Jesus pro proclaimed his attitude toward the law. Position, authority, and money are not important in his kingdom. What matters is faithful obedience from the heart. The Sermon on the Mount challenged the proud and legalistic religious leaders of the day. It called them back to the messages of the Old Testament prophets, who, like Jesus, taught that heartfelt obedience is more important than legalistic observance. Okay, this is 5, 1 through 2. Enormous crowds were following Jesus. He was the talk of the town, and everyone wanted to see him. 
The disciples, who were the closest associates of this popular man, were certainly tempted to feel important, proud, and possessive. Being with Jesus gave them not only prestige, but only, but also opportunity for receiving money and power. The crowds were gathering once again, but before speaking to them, Jesus pulled his disciples aside and warned them about the temptations they would face as his associates. Don't expect the don't expect fame and fortune, Jesus was saying, but mourning, hunger, and persecution. Nevertheless, Jesus assured his disciples that they would be rewarded, but perhaps not in this life. There may be times when following Jesus will bring us great popularity. If we don't live by Jesus' words in this sermon, we will find ourselves using God's message only to promote our personal interests. Jesus began his sermon with words that seemed to contradict each other, but God's way of living usually contradicts the world. If you want to live for God, you must be ready to say and do what seems strange to the world. You must be willing to give when others take, to love when others hate, to help when others abuse. By giving up your own rights in order to serve others, you will one day receive everything God has in store for you. The Beatitudes can be understood in at least four ways. One, they are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. Two, they contrast kingdom values, that is eternal, with worldly values, what is temporary. They contrast the superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith that Christ demands. And four, they show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled for the or in the new kingdom. These beatitudes are not multiple choice. Pick what you like and leave the rest. They must be taken as a whole. They describe what we should be like as Christ's followers. Each beatitude tells how to be blessed by God. Blessed means more than happiness. It implies the fortunate or inviolable state of those who are in God's kingdom. The beatitudes don't promise laughter, pleasure, or earthly prosperity. Being blessed by God means the experience of hope and joy, independent of outward circumstances. To find hope and joy, the deepest form of happiness, follow Jesus no matter what the cost. So, with Jesus' announcement that the kingdom was near, which is chapter 4, verse 17 of Matthew, People were naturally asking, how do I qualify to be in God's kingdom? Jesus said that God's kingdom is organized differently from worldly kingdoms. In the kingdom of heaven, wealth and power and authority are unimportant. Kingdom people seek different blessings and benefits, and they have different attitudes. Are your attitudes a carbon copy of the world's selfishness, pride, and lust for power, or do they reflect the humility and self-sacrifice of Jesus, your King? Jesus said to be happy when we're persecuted for our faith. Persecution can be good because, one, it takes our eyes off earthly rewards. Two, it strips away superficial belief. Three, it strengthens the faith of those who endure. And four, our attitude through it serves as an example to others who follow. We can be comforted knowing that God's greatest prophets were persecuted. Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel. The fact that we, were, we are being persecuted proves that we have been faithful. Faithless people would be unnoticed. 
In the future, God will reward the faithful by receiving them into His eternal kingdom, where there is no more persecution. So, I'm going to stop right there because I only read to verse 12. So, we started, or just read, the very beginning introduction of Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Which these things would, he's telling us what would, the blessed, what are blessed, or for the kingdom of God. Which is important. We need to know these things. Voices or vision by personal purity. I'm going to be reading this. Purity is not innocence. It is much more. Purity is the outcome of sustained spiritual sympathy with God. We have to grow in purity. The life with God may be right, and the inner purity remain unsullied. And yet every now and again, the bloom on the outside may be sullied. God does not shield us from this possibility, because in this way we realize the necessity of maintaining the vision by personal purity. If the spiritual bloom of our life with God is getting impaired in the tiniest degree, we must leave off everything and get it put right. Remember that vision depends on character. The pure in heart see God. So that's the verse of the day. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God makes us pure by His sovereign grace. But we have something to look after. His bodily life by which we come in contact with other people and with other points of views, it is these that are apt to sully. Not only must the inner sanctuary be kept right with God, but our outer courts as well are to be brought into perfect accord with the purity God gives us by His grace. The spiritual understanding is blurred immediately. The outer court is sullied. If we are going to retain personal contact with Lord Jesus Christ, it will mean there are some things we must scorn to do or to think. Some legitimate things we must scorn to touch. A practical way of keeping personal purity unsullied in relation to other people is to say to yourself, that man, that woman, perfect in Christ, that friend, that relative, perfect Christ Jesus. Perfect in Christ Jesus. I love the verse today. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So no matter what in our walk, it talks about being pure. It's having Jesus in our heart all the time. And um, and working towards the betterment of our, our lives serving Him. And that's, that's purity. I like these, uh, these verses because it really hints on who are blessed. And it, and, it, and it takes a full heart to do it. So... I'm going to probably read more of this Sermon on the Mount today. But it also has, if you keep going, it talks about believers are as salt and light, Christ in the law, Jesus in anger, Christian relationships, Jesus teaching on adultery, on divorce and remarriage, the significance of words, 
retaliation, the law of love. There's a lot, it just, there's a lot to go here. And it's a good place to start reading about the Sermon on the Mount. Well, start reading about the Sermon on the Mount. Well, God bless you guys. Today's another great day. We can give it to God. <coughs> Let's give Him our best. He's given us His best. That's the least we can do. Well, guys, I'm going to get off here. Got to go to work. But... I hope you guys really do have a good day and no matter what if you're going through a storm or if things aren't going right in your life just remember that Jesus is with you the Lord's with you everywhere you go and there's a bigger plan to what's going on but you got to seek within to him to see what's going on with your heart and you might he might be working on you to do something I don't know but you got to have that personal relationship with God, that purity. So God bless you guys. Thank you for listening again. See ya.